cooling and heating. Let's talk about cooling and heating. First of all, I'd like to know, how do you feel? Do you feel hot, warm, a bit warm, neutral, a bit cold, cool or cold? Usually, I'm in a classroom and I can ask everybody how they feel about the same room. And usually people have different ideas. So some people are going to feel warm, some people will feel cold, some people will feel hot. And what we can do with these, we can get a score from each person. Each person gives a score from minus three if they feel hot, plus three if they feel cold. And then we can add up everyone's scores. We can see what the average is, the mean. This is called the predicted mean vote. And from this, you get a predicted percentage dissatisfied. These can be called PMV and PPD. So if you've got, if you, the average is zero, probably 5% will still be dissatisfied. You can get the average for each person because everybody is different. There are still going to be some people are going to be unhappy, but it'll be about 5%. If you get an average, if it's if PMV goes up to 0.5 or down to minus 0.5, then about 10% will be dissatisfied. 90% will be satisfied. So that's probably still OK. You can't make everybody comfortable. And if it goes up plus one or minus one, you'll get about 28% dissatisfied. And this number gets bigger. You're going to have more people will be uncomfortable. Now, this brings us to the question of environmental control and the question of what, what should a building do? And in most cases, buildings are supposed to be comfortable for people. So we can look at a building. A building is a machine to control the environment. Often outside it's not comfortable, so we have buildings to make it comfortable, to make a comfortable environment. So why, then on to the next question, why do we feel hot or cold? What makes us feel hot or cold? Could you go off and make, go and make a list, make a list of things that make you feel hot or make you feel cold? And then come back. Let's compare lists. My list has about six ideas on it. There may be more. So, so here are things affecting apparent temperature. First of all, of course, is the air temperature. So how hot is the air actually? Another thing that affects how hot it feels is radiation. Why does radiation affect how hot we feel? And where does the radiation come from? Humidity is another thing that affects the temperature or the apparent temperature, how hot we feel. Again, why does why and how does this work? Air movement also affects how hot we feel. Why? And our activity also affects how hot we feel. And our clothes affect how hot we feel. So just going back to the first, going back to the first question about how you feel, if we have everyone in the same room, people will be wearing different clothes. Some people may have just run to the classroom and have been very active. Some people may have been sitting still for a long time. So these things will be different and affect different people. And of course, different people are different. So there may be many other things that you come up with that are not on my list. But let's look at the things that are on my list and have a think about these things. So how, 
How does air temperature make us feel hotter or colder? Why? Why does radiation make us feel hotter or colder? How about humidity? We're also going with humidity and air movement. Why does air movement make us feel hotter or colder? And what about activity? Why does that make us feel hotter or colder? And I have a question next for you. Heating makes us hotter. Is this true or false? If we're cold, maybe we want to switch on the heating, but does the heating make us warmer? So let's think about radiation then. What does, there's a radiant temperature. So two of the big factors in how hot we feel, first of all, is the air around us. The next thing is radiation and from all around us, heat is being radiated. And we can, we can know this from, if it's a sunny day, we can go outside and the air can be really cold. But if the sun is shining, we can feel quite warm. And this is the radiant temperature and the air temperature. So if we have a room where the air is at 23 degrees and all the walls around us are at 23 degrees, then we'll feel comfortable. That's a fairly comfortable temperature for us. But this will feel the same as if the surface temperatures are at 17 degrees and the air temperature is 28 degrees. So sometimes if you're in a cold room, you need to put the heating on really high to feel warm. And that's because the walls are cold and the ceiling is cold and the floor is cold and all this cold radiation is coming towards you. In fact, it's the other way around. Your body is radiating away and it radiates away to the walls, and the walls are radiating back to you. And if there's a big temperature difference, then you're radiating more heat away, and you're getting less heat radiating into you. Um, so um, again, think of a cold, if it's a cold night with no clouds, and you look up, your heat's just going straight into space, and nothing is coming back, so it can feel really cold. The other thing with radiation for comfort, then, um, is what's called radiant symmetry. And this means you've got heat radiating from different places being the same. And the, if there's a difference, then it feels less comfortable. Um, so uh, there's a difference, then. Often you have a difference between the temperature of your head and the temperature of your, of your feet. Um, this is a picture of a, a I think this is a, a typical living room in Japan. And you can see this is a thermograph. So we can see the temperature on this picture. At the bottom, it's 12.3 degrees. And at the top, it's 23.7 degrees. So it's quite a comfortable temperature um, above your head. But at your feet, it's really quite cold. And often you'll get this in a room um, where the temperature, there's a big temperature difference you put on the heater and the hot air comes out of the heater, and the hot air go all goes up into the um, into the roof. So you can be quite cold when you're sitting down, and then when you stand up, your head gets quite hot. Um, humidity then. Humidity can, um, if you get an extra 10% humidity, then the temperature, it can feel about 1% warmer. So especially in the summer, when you have a humid day in the summer, it can feel really, really hot because it's really humid. Um, this effect, this is true at um, any temperature. Well, it's different at different temperatures. Um, why is this happening? Um, the reason why this happens, why does this happen? Um, this is a humidity chart. So you can see the temperature. Um, the black, the black area, the gray area is how hot or how humid it is outside. So there's quite a big range. Um, the green area is the comfort zone. So this is the area that's comfortable. So often outside, a lot of the temperatures and humidities outside are uncomfortably hot or uncomfortably cold. Um, and 
this is um, the reason for this is we lose heat. Um, we are about 36, 37 degrees. And we're a lot warmer than outside. So what's happening all the time, we're losing heat. And the way we feel if we lose more heat, if we're losing more heat, we'll feel cold. And if we're losing less heat, we feel warm. And the way that we lose heat is our skin is not dry. Our skin is wet and the moisture is evaporating from our skin. So we lose heat by evaporating moisture from our skin. Um, and if it's humid, the moisture, it's more difficult for the moisture to evaporate. If it's dry, the moisture leaves very quickly and cools us down. If it's humid, it's more difficult for the moisture to evaporate. So humidity makes a difference to how hot we feel because it changes the amount of evaporation and it changes how quickly um, the moisture leaves our body and that changes how quickly our body feels cool. Uh, the next thing then that makes a difference, of course, is air movement. So as the air moves more quickly, um, more of the air next to our body and our heat is taken away. So if you have a higher, if it's still, then it will feel warmer. And again, if you're outside on a cold day, if there's no wind and it's sunny, then you can feel really quite warm and quite comfortable. But if it's windy, the wind can really chill. The wind can take away, because it's taking away your body heat. Um, so does heating make us hotter? Well, not really. Um, we make us hotter. <laughs> Our bodies make themselves hotter. Um, we put out about 100 watts. So each of us is a heater. We're heating. Um, and if you're in a well-insulated house, if you have a few people in the house, you don't need a heater. We're putting out plenty of heat ourselves. Um, but what heating does, if we turn the heating on, it makes us lose less heat. Um, so it doesn't really make us hotter. It's not really, not really true. Um, what about the summer then? We're thinking of winter now, probably. We're thinking of heating now. Um, does insulation make a building hotter? in the summer. If we have insulation, um, if we have insulation, as I said, we don't need heating if we put enough insulation around us. Like you put a warm coat on and go outside in the winter and you'll stay warm if you've got a good, a good warm coat on. The same with insulation. So how about summer? Does, does insulation make a building hotter in the summer? Um, what do you think about this? Is this true or false? Insulation works the same for keeping buildings cool in a hot climate. So if it's hot outside and you're trying to keep your house cool inside, does insulation work the same way? Um, some buildings don't need insulation. Is that true? So um, cooling then, cooling. Sometimes in the summer we need to cool down. Um, and insulation slows the movement of heat. So insulation doesn't make anything hot and it doesn't make anything cold. If it's hot, it will slow it down from getting cooler. And if it's cold, it will slow it down from getting hotter. So if you have, um, this is the same whether it's hot or cold. Um, insulation doesn't make anything hot. It doesn't make anything cold. Um, Many things in a house create extra heat. So we have lots of things in a house. Um, I'm sitting next to a computer. This is putting out heat all the time. Um, hot water, we have a hot water, a boiler in the house for when you need a bath or put the hot tap on. Um, cooking is putting out heat. Uh, people are putting out 100 watts each. If you have a pet, pets are putting out heat. So all of these things are, um, are making 
are helping us to heat the house, but also they're making it more difficult to cool the house. Just to look at some temperature differences, um, I've picked a couple of places. Yakutsk is in Siberia in Russia. It's one of the coldest places in the world where people live. Um, the average winter temperature is minus 34 degrees centigrade. And uh, Kuwait is a pretty hot place. It's one of the hottest places people live. And this has an average summer temperature of plus 38. Now, um, minus 34, plus 38, these seem similar. Um, minus 34 sounds very cold, plus 38 sounds very hot. Um, but if we remember that we want to be around 20 or 25 degrees, the temperature difference um, is quite extreme. So the temperature difference in Yakutsk is 54 Kelvin. The temperature difference in Kuwait is only 12 Kelvin. So cold places are much colder uh, compared to comfortable room temperature than the hot places are hot. Um, interesting, a couple of interesting facts for you. We think of Australia, we think of as a hot country. But in fact, cold weather in Australia is much more dangerous than hot weather. Um, over 10 times more people die of the cold in Australia than they do die of the heat. Um, and that's for a hot country. Interestingly as well, if we compare Australia with Sweden, Sweden is in Scandinavia. It's a very cold part of the world. Not as cold as, as uh, Yakutsk in Siberia, but in Sweden it gets really pretty cold. But more people die of cold in Australia than they do in Sweden. Um, and the reason for this is insulation. So in Sweden, they have houses that are made from, for the winter and they're made to keep people warm in the winter. Australia, many houses don't have insulation. So it's not really cold in the winter, but it does have a winter and it is cold and it, and it does kill people. Uh, that's data from 2015. Um, I hope the data's got better since then. Um, but so on to cooling then. So if we're trying to, if we are trying to cool, um, these are many different ways that we can make a house cool or keep a house cool. Um, we can use windows, insulation, thermal mass, heat exchange, ventilation, air conditioners, dehumidifiers, fans, trees, ice. Um, so how do they all work then? How does each one of these keep the house cool? And what are their problems or limitations? Um, let's start with windows. If you have a window, if it's, if it's hot, you can open the window and it will cool you down. Um, it will do this. You need to actually open two windows, really. Um, so the air comes in one and out of the other. And this can work with, if you have a window on the north, say in the south, then, and there's wind outside, you'll get air blowing through the house. Or you can have, there's a temperature difference with height. So if you have a, a high window and a low window open, then you'll get airflow going through and out and out of this window. Um, of course, if there's no wind, <laughs> then opening your windows will not help the airflow um, and depends on the outside temperature. If it's hotter outside than inside, if it's 25 degrees inside and 35 outside and you open the window, you're going to get hot air coming into the house. So it may not always work. Windows can be good for cooling your house down, um, but not always. Um, insulation, on the other hand, insulation keeps hot things hot and keeps cold things cold. So if you have a well insulated house in the summer, it will stop the house from getting hotter. Or it will make the house get less hotter. Insulation doesn't make cold, so insulation will not make your house cold. But if it is cooler, it will stop it from getting warmer as quickly. Um, this is where I should mention a thermal mass. 
Um, so if your if your house can hold heat, then um, it will take longer to heat up in the daytime. And um, your your building does need to lose heat at night time. So if it doesn't get cold at night, um, then having thermal mass just means you're going to get hotter. So a concrete building has more thermal mass, but it may just get hot and stay hot and it's not going to cool down. Um, so let's call in um, let's call in an air conditioner. Um, air conditioners do make things cold, um, and they work by what's called the Carnot cycle. Uh, Carnot, you may remember from the second law of thermodynamics, which is that heat goes from hot to cold. Now, to make an air conditioner work, we need to break this law. We need to make make things go from um, a, make heat go from a cold place to a hot place which is not possible so how do we do it and what we do is we we play a trick with pressure and heat and to work this out we need to think about the relationship with heat and temperature and pressure and volume so let's just think about what's the relationship between heat and temperature um, and another question, if you compress a gas, if you have a gas that has a certain amount of heat and you squash it to this size, uh, what happens to the heat in the gas? Um, and what happens to the temperature? And if a gas expands, um, what happens to the temperature now? And this is, um, uh, so far we've had no equations today, I think, um, and no maths. There is no maths today, uh, but I am gonna show you um, an equation, if I may. In fact, I'm gonna show you four equations. If you don't like equations, just close your eyes. Uh, these are gas laws, and um, there's there's the Gay-Lussac law, which is if you have a fixed volume, then pressure is proportional to temperature. So if you have a fixed volume of gas, if you heat it up, the pressure will go up. Um, if you have a fixed temperature, then the pressure is inversely proportional to the volume. So if the volume goes down the pressure will go up and if the volume goes up if it gets bigger the pressure will drop and also um there's avogadro which we need to think about to work to come to the the equation on the right which we don't need to worry about so much what we just need to worry about is is what we've got um in a heat pump this is how a heat pump works so basically we have a cold part and a hot part. And what we want is we want to make the heat go from the cold part to the hot part. So at the top, we've got a pump and the pump starts pumping heat around here. And as it pumps, um, that's hot. And because it's hot, it's losing heat. And as it goes around to the bottom, it goes through a valve. And when it's gone through the valve, the pressure drops and because the pressure drops it gets colder and because it gets colder it starts taking in heat from the cold place and then it goes back to the pump again the pump squashes it the temperature goes up and it goes into the hot place and loses heat so this is how a, this is how a, um, an air conditioner works it's also how your refrigerator works and um, this is called a Carnot cycle. And it's, it's a good way. Your air conditioner can also produce heat. So if you have an air conditioner producing heat, this is how that works. You can also use the same technique for heating up water. And you can make hot water this way. And it's a very, um, it's a very efficient way of making heat. Um, there's a nice little graph here, which shows what's happening um, in relation to pressure and volume. 
Um, and is it's not it's not free. You do need to put some energy in to get this heat out. Um, and it's usually measured in COP, which is the coefficient of performance, which is how much heat comes out compared to how much energy goes in. Um, and this depends on the temperature difference. So as the temperature difference gets bigger, um, we have less efficiency. Um, you need some temperature difference, um, but the temperature difference, bigger temperature difference, more difficult, less temperature difference, more easy. Um, so there, there you go. That's how that's how the heat pump works. That's a way of getting a getting a house cool. Also, a way of getting a house hot. Um, so just still on cooling. Then um, here are a few more facts, um, which seem to be true as I check today. Um, 40% of power in Mumbai is air conditioning. So there are some very big cities in India that get very, very hot and they use a lot of their energy. At peak times, it's more than 40%. And most of this is going to make places cool. And there are still many people who don't have air conditioning in these cities. Um, it's been estimated by 2060, we will use more energy for cooling than we will for heating. Uh, this is not just because of, of global warming, because of climate change. Um, it's also we have large populations living in hot countries. Um, and at the moment, I, I, I think, again, I think this was true. The US uses more electricity for cooling. Uh, so the air conditioner was invented in America. Uh, the US has lots of air conditioners. And they use more more electricity apparently for these than the whole of Africa for everything. Um, also, if you have an old refrigerator, if you're worried about global warming, um, the gases in refrigerators are very, very damaging for global warming. Um, so if you're going to keep a house, if you want to keep a house cool, um, the first way to do it, if possible, is using insulation. Um, if you're, wherever you are, having more insulation, it will keep your house, it'll keep your house warmer in the winter, and it will keep your house cooler in the summer, if that's an issue. Um, shading is also very important. If you're living in a hot country, a temperate country even, uh, the sun puts out lots of heat. In the winter, this is useful because it will warm up your house. In the summer, when it's hot, you need to shut out, you need shade on the outside of the windows, which will stop the house from getting warmer. Um, trees may also be very useful. If it's possible to plant trees around your house, these can also provide shade. Um, they can also cool the house down. Um, heat exchange ventilation we will talk about next week. Um, that's another way to keep your house cool. Um, fans are also a good way to cool you down if it's a little bit warm. Um, the fans work by moving the air. The air moves to you and cools you down. Um, fans do not reduce the temperature. They just move the air around. So you can't leave a fan switched on in a room to make it cool. It will only be cool if you're standing next to it and it's moving air past you. Um, and dehumidifiers are another way to reduce the temperature. If in the summer you have humid a humid room, if you can drop the humidity, then you can reduce the apparent temperature so it will feel cooler. Um, here are all the ways that you can keep a house cool. And of course, air conditioners will also keep a house cool. Um, they may be necessary in many places. Um, as a house gets better insulated, there's always a danger of overheating, especially if you don't think about shading. Um, and if you can put shading in, 
that's better than using an air conditioner. But air conditioners are effective for keeping your house cool. Um, here are some references. I was um, looking at some a paper from um, 1973 before. A lot of the research on comfort is very old. And also, again, this is 1973, assessment of man's thermal comfort in practice. Um, this is not looking at, at women's thermal comfort or children's thermal comfort. And of course, men are different to women and children. So making a place comfortable for many different people um, is a challenge. And a lot of the research was done by men in the 1970s. Um, uh, that's where the data came from Australia for Australia being a killer. And um, this is where I've taken the images from. Thank you very much.